this provocation to think about and kind of irritated me a lot, which is good. Um, and uh, so I put down the two titles, <coughs> Working Knowledge and Urban Humanities, and thought about it a lot. And John was kind enough to send me a paper of his, and I wrote comments back. And so we have developed a conversation already. And so you're not seeing a presentation of a paper and questions because he's already answered the questions which I sent him, and I'm going to respond back to him. So we're actually on a roll with this to a certain extent, for better or for worse. The other thing I want to say before I start is, <laughs> um, all that I'm going to say is indicative. It's not prescriptive, right? You don't have to do what I say, uh, but I do want by the end of this presentation that you know the way I'm approaching this project. I've been trying to get it out in various ways down here and up there for some time, but now I decided I can't afford to wait anymore. So it's, I've got to tell you what I think and to see the extent to which there's common ground. And John's presentation brings out an awful lot of common ground that we can all see much that we're familiar with in some cases, which is helping us to, to come together in this way. It's clear when you look at this proliferation of work, because I was really happy to see John again and, and catch up with all the things that he's been engaged in, which in some ways are remarkably similar to some of the stuff that I've been doing, but I haven't been up to date with what he's doing. We're doing a lot of interesting things, and a proliferation of stuff is going on. Um, it's the, all those titles, which I'll come up and talk about in, in a moment, but it, it's characteristic of these, I, I think they are revolutionary times. Um, to say that there are new forms of knowledge which are developing promiscuously without kind of uh, any, well, actually without much thought in lots of cases. Um, not much discernment, at least, between what's being produced. And it's this discernment character question that I want to address very briefly. So I'm going to just say, in my working knowledge about the urban humanities, what I want to deal with is I want to deal with this proliferation question. Um, I want to start looking at the various lexicons that we use uh, to describe the work that we're doing. I want to examine what this claim towards transdisciplinarity means. It's not interdisciplinary, it's not multidisciplinary, it's trans, which implies some sort of fusion of different approaches. Um, I'd like you to show me good cases of the work that you, that you would regard as good exemplars. I will show you some of mine. These are challenges for me as well as for you, of course. I also need to be very clear about the standards of evidence now, more clear than I have been in the past, because we can't give a free pass to a pretty map anymore, um, especially when we come to those maps from the outside, because we don't know, and including myself, does, we don't know what's gone into those maps, the amount of errors in those maps, which are cumulative and effectively reduce the map to nothing more than a pretty design, which is okay, but it's not containing any information of value because it's so wrong. So what standards of evidence are we all going to introduce into this work? How do we measure the outcomes of the work? I want to know why your work is superior. John showed us some really interesting examples, and they are they really are insightful. I really like the ones about the Mediterranean especially, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Because what people are uncovering in the Goldsmiths people in their forensic architecture, for example, Tre Tre Trevor Paglin's work, finding out things that we never knew about the world, about the way the world works, that's valuable, but we can, and we can actually say what's new. I need to know that. So in the end, I mean, I want us to be able to show the difference that transdisciplinary urban research makes. If we can't do that, then we've had an interesting time, um, which is good, but it's not enough. So, let me start with the lexicons. I'll be brief, because there's so, there's so much to say, and because John's at least uh, teased out some of these ideas before. This is us on the left, and that's John Pickles on the far right of the conversation, okay? And I just picked those out of the paper, um, and I added a couple. He's, he's also added a few in his conversation today to show you the way the cartographers are discussing their work. I don't know what all those things mean, which is where we began the conversation which John talked about a bit before today. We also need to be clear, because I'm really getting a little bit annoyed now at this left-hand column. Because um, we've got the urban humanities and we worry about what that is. I don't. Right? 
And then this proliferation of digital humanities, spatial humanities, historical GIS, digital textual studies was in the New York Times over the weekend. Um, the humanities have gone berserk, actually. Now, look, the humanities is a big field. I understand that. But I mean, what, if, what is exactly happening in, in this kind of development? And when does it become valuable to the rest of us and to human, humanities scholars and themselves? We've got GIS and geohumanities in the background. Geohumanities were, were one of my terms, um, which refers to a, a broader range of geographic, geographical and human, humanities work, which is not solely digital in its basis. So I, we, we, we need that lexicon. We need to know what, the, what these terms are that we're dealing with. Also, you need to show me good cases. I don't think it's enough to show good, pretty maps. Okay? So forensic, um, Weisman's group, and um, the others in Goldsmith's forensic architecture, and Trevor Paglin's work, is good because it shows culpability. It's very clever. It is really painstaking. I mean, the torture taxi book by Paglin, where he showed the, the, uh, the torture, uh, the rendition trips by these planes, Hundreds and hundreds of people across the world contributed to that, to that work. And it took a few other people to put it together in, a, in actually a brilliant way. One of my favorite examples, I don't mind if you like this or not, Franco Moretti's work on distant reading. Why was that so clever? Because the digital capacities that he introduced into the work made it possible to turn attention away from the canon to the archive. And so you, you saw what was behind the 10,000th volume this year on Jane Austen. There was more gone on in the past before that was valuable. In the same way, I've often thought you know, in random moments, you know, what happened to all of that work that people didn't publish? And it was, it was probably good work, but it never saw the light of day because it didn't come out with the regular channels. Moretti turns around and says, look at what those irregular channels show. That is paradigm busting. Whether you like it or not, I'm very impressed by that. What did John Pickle say? He's, he's already spoken for himself. Um, Todd, 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 you've got to show me now what works about thick mapping. You know, I've gone carefully through the book, and I want you to, at some point, you'll be able to tell me what's the value added. That seems to I, I set the same exact question for myself. So there's some good cases. We know how it works, but why is it good? What claims are being made by various people? And I don't need to go through this. You can read the, uh, the end, uh, the left-hand side, which talks out about moving from knowledge to action. There are different stages, and you can manufacture your own list. I don't mind. The point about the, the pickles excursion to Rambulation, if I might put it that way, it's a good point, but I lost it now. <laughs> um, the point of what John talked about is perambulations around new, the new cartographies. I mean, you, can, you can see what goes into this presentation. You can see the structure of the logic. You can, it betrays itself deliberately and valuably. So I'm going to do quantitative work. I'm going to do qualitative work. Impressionistic maps of Canarinka um, in recreating the names of Cambridge. And then I'm going to go on and I'm going to do a critical cartography. There's that word, watch it, critical. Now, what Pickles does then is his perambulation is from learning from the quantitative. This is the perambulation. Learning from the quantitative, arriving via the cognitive, cognitive and political to the final destination of action. You don't have to agree with me, you don't have to like what he does, but you know what he's doing, and you know the, the process of the work. My criticism of a lot of humanities work is that very often humanities scholars in their published works that I read at least don't bother to provide that map. They just do the work. Uh, and you, you assume, and you, of course most of you can do that, you can assume that the structure, the paradigm is so powerful that you don't need to explain it every time, but in a new revolutionary period, you do need to explain it. You can't assume that I'm going to, John will not assume, I know that he's going to drag me along with him in this, in this methodological approach. 
but it's a very important I can read it. I know what standards of evidence are being addressed and how they're being used. I like that idea. And I, I like that um, one other thing about, about what, if you take John's perambulation as a, as a, as a template now, what, what the, the Pickles approach in this paper and in the work that he presented today allows you, I think, to devise a common template by which to judge other people's work. So, for example, retrieving Gunnar Olsen's work on cartography was an important step in that direction. Going along with Deleuze and Guattari, I'm not the biggest fans. That's okay. okay. But I can see where what that template looks like, and moreover, I can translate that template into mine. You can translate your work using that right-hand column, crude as it is, to know where you come from and where you're going. If you can translate, Todd, your, your, your journey in that way, you know, you, you, you're doing something relatively valuable and you're unco uncovering a common ground, which it seems to me has been so difficult to do, for good reason. How do we know what we did was good? I like this idea because it's infuriating and it's really hard. Um, and I don't trust my own judgments with this sometimes. I mean, uh, I'll give you one example of how I don't trust my judgment. My good friend and colleague, Whitney Davis from uh, Berkeley is with us. <clears throat> He's written a beautiful book called The General Theory of Visual Culture. It is beautiful. Um, but I looked at the title and I broke out in a rash. Anytime people start off with a grand theory of, of anything, I just kind of start to shake. General, um, not grand. General, not grand. General, not grand. So it's a bit more modest than anyone would be. But, but he, he can tell you himself, he ends up not with what you think he does. I mean, he ends up um, basically as something that's it's an unstable historical generalization of culture and human vision, never completed or wholly comprehensive, especially for emerging configurative consolidations of recognizing recognizable aspectivity. It's not something that's fixed. It's not something that's general. It's certainly not something that's grand. So if you approach the book like I did, expecting a, a grand theory because it's promised in the title, it doesn't come out that way. And I prefer it because of that. I'm not criticizing I'm just saying I want to be careful with the words. I want to be careful with the claims that are being made here. On the left-hand side, it's easy. On the right-hand side, it's not so easy. Uh, it's not possible to split that into uh, humanities versus the rest kind of column. But all of those things that I learned when I was in graduate school about explanation, truth, replicability, parsimony, Evidence-based, proof was elegant, we loved it. It was wrong, but we loved it. How many times did we start our macroeconomics lessons in those days with, let's assume a Cobb-Douglas function? My response, why? And why would you do that? Because, well, we did it because the math was easy. It, it wasn't anything, I think, that's especially profound in, in behavioral terms. But it was elegant, it, it, you could differentiate it, and you were fine. That's one way of thinking about acceptability in evidence. Pure theory, Whitney doesn't use it, but there's another, another phrase that I really get hides. Basic science I worry about all the time because of the claims that they made. But, but you, you, can, you can use all these criteria for judgment and then go on to the right hand side and start talking about, it, talking about interpretation. Interpretation. Pleasure. The simple pleasure of working with you guys is enough for me, actually, when it comes, when it comes down to it. I want to be fashionable, as Alan was saying earlier. Um, you know, one wants to be au, au courant um, and, and be doing good stuff. Critical is a word which I now uh, shy away from. Work, if it's action inspired, might be valuable. Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, said, you judge a theory by the quality of the practice that comes from it. So that's all those are ways of judging what you're doing and the, let me be, be deliberate, the truth claims that you're advancing. Your truth claim could in fact be a concordance with a belief. So really, the early humanities problematic updated 2.0 toxic version is that all the knowledge that we created is provisional. 
You know that. Right? And it's, it's, it's knowledge which is created and situated at a particular time. It's to do with preference as much as anything else. I, I showed the concordance. We judge, it, we judge work by its concordance with our beliefs. It can be a belief in science, it can be a belief in Marx, it can be a belief in the beauty of things. It's enough, isn't it, to go down to um, the new music building. Uh, I can't, I can't, what's the name of the building? Down there, the Kevin Daly just produced a gorgeous new building just on the block. Uh, the, the aesthetics of it are enough. That's, that's, the, that's the outcome for judging the work. But you go inside and like I, well, like I did this morning and say, do you like working here? Does it work here? And the people who work, I really like it. And that's another level of functionality. It's obvious, I know it's obvious, but I'm again trying to make that point about uh, clarification and specification of the means by which we judge the work that we do. I can live with provisionality. We, we have no choice. Um, I can live with preference because you know you might not agree with me, but and I know I'm right, so we can get along. Um, but I do think that we all need to do the following. Now, we need to push toward that common ground. And you saw some common ground unveiled in Pickle's presentations, her revelations. But I need, you to, I need you to tell me what your standard of evidence is. What is the basis for the claim that what you're doing is better? Simply doing digital humanities is not enough. I mean, the, my theorists all, are always, I'm sorry, um, but the historical GIS, the historians have discovered maps. And I'm very happy for them. But if the map is not the end product. The map is the beginning of insight and analysis. You tell me, please, what the standards of evidence are that you're using. And also, can you, while you're at it, can you also clarify what claims are being made for your transdisciplinary practice? I don't think it's hard to do, but it has to be done. And you can't any longer take it for granted. I don't think a lot of us are taking it for granted. And I think that's probably all I have to say. So, John, thank you very much. Follow me or not, I don't mind. This is not indicative. This is not, no, this is indicative, not prescriptive. Um, but you do have, we all do have a responsibility to answer the questions which I tried to raise. Thank you.